So can you break down why you put the Infester on this pixel and how you predicted his scan placement? It just looked like the correct pixel to me. <laughs> There's not much else to it. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Serral has joined us on stream. He's going to be breaking down his massive grand finals over Maru recently with me. I think this was probably one of the most dominant runs at Akatavitsa. I think you only dropped one map to dark in this tournament. So what do you reckon? Was there, was there anything special or you just trained really hard for this tournament, man? Well, I think I have been pretty good for a long time already. Uh, it's just been a little bit unfortunate at the bigger events. But um, yeah, I think just a good play in general and having some pills. I don't think I used too many pills this event. I actually had a decent amount of stuff planned, but every time I had like a build planned on a specific map, someone threw me away or, or <laughs> in the early game or something. So I just had to play reactive after afterwards. So I actually ended up using very few of my builds. But, oh, damn. Uh, we could have seen some more cheeky all-ins from you and stuff, but people kept attacking you and messing you up first, eh? Yeah, I'm actually pretty good at like coming up with some kind of, well, not like massive adjustments in builds and that kind of stuff. And Well, I'm not necessarily good at that, but uh, I'm extremely good at hiding stuff and uh, not using them. Sometimes I hide them for years and then I never, <laughs> then the bad patch changes or something and I never got to use them because I always <laughs> wait for the right moment, but uh, sometimes there's never, never right moments. That's, that's awesome. You're, you're saving your, your sharpest knives, your sharpest tools for the right moment, right? You don't want to use a really cool all-in timing attack in a group stage match that doesn't matter. You want to save it for the top four, right? Yeah. And the thing is that usually if you pl I play against someone who I <clears throat> think I'm going to win with standard play, I don't want to get too crazy in those matches. That makes sense. I mean, yeah, if you can... <laughs> why, use, why use up your limited secret builds when you can just beat them with uh, straight up stuff, right? So not a bad way of doing it. So this is the start of the series. You did a really cool roach timing this game. I was referencing your games versus Maru from Masters Coliseum. When I was watching this, I was thinking, oh, you know, Masters Coliseum 6, not 7. The, the one in, I think that was like September 2023, maybe a little earlier, maybe August, um, where you did a lot of, you know, these 15-15 kind of roach attacks to him. You scared him a bit. You did a really fast Ultralisk build. Was that kind of history between the two of you part of the mind games here on Hecate? Sure, but at the same time, this build wasn't really a meta game build in any way. I just think it was a good build <coughs> against anyone, really. And uh, it's a bit different from a... I always used to do because I I go go way faster with this one, so it hits a bit faster and I think it's a strong build. But uh, I mainly used it just because this map's so bad. It's obviously my first Vito and have very little experience on it. Well, yeah. I have a decent amount of experience on it, but like at least like very little tournament experience in it because you pretty much don't play them if it's not the best of seven. Uh, and you can already see it when I lost my first two links because I sent them the wrong way, which is an extremely dumb mistake. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I just uh, wanted to use something different on this map. I wasn't really confident in playing an ab absolutely standard match. Makes perfect sense. It's like your worst map, as you said. You want to try and catch, you know, you're going to use something a bit more risky. And you, you, you probably wouldn't be doing this on Equilibrium, right? On, on, on Rad Who Set Station, on your map picks, because... You don't want to risk such a good macro map just doing such a big aggressive push. In some way, but at the same time, those are also the best, sometimes the best chances to use those builds just because there's a good chance the opponent's playing a bit more on the greedy side as well. But uh, I'm also pretty good at usually, I feel like I win more on like the little slightly unfavored Zerg maps. Like on Equilibrium, I lose a lot, I feel like. I don't even know why it is, but like, <laughs> super good Zerg maps are not even my favorite maps usually. But, I, don't, um, do, yeah, do you... I think these maps are just extremely bad. You know, I've been talking about that actually for a long time, going back to Submarine. You on Cyber Forest and Submarine were small maps that were meant to be good for Terran. You had, I think, your best first Terran win rates on those maps. And this is years ago, but Beckett Industries, you had a very good win rate on that map. So basically, every map that's really bad for Zerg versus Terran, you historically actually have a great win rate on. Yeah, I've been thinking about it, and uh, I it is kind of, I don't know, but for some reason, I always do pretty good on those maps. It's a good talent to have, man. So many Zergs, it's a free loss on these maps. So <laughs> it really makes a difference in a series. Yeah, it is helpful. 
<laughs> well, anyway, let's let's go back and talk about this push just a little bit to, to wrap it up for, for people who, who know what's happening. I mean, you're hitting... I guess we can watch the fight first. But you're hitting at like 5.15 or something like that with three queens and a speed overlord. I think it's like 12 roaches, is it? And And... You're actually macroing behind this. So is this an all-in? Is it a stiff pressure? Like, can you just talk me through this build a little bit? Yeah, well, it's pretty common that build. I, I, I believe I made like 16 roaches at least uh, before droning up. At least uh, in practice, I always went to like 84 supply or so before starting my droning. But it's a committed push, but uh, it's, it's just like, I feel like even if you just kill the depots or something, and then you start spurning creep on like the third base location. It's usually pretty good for you. It's kind of like the Eric thing, right? But I feel like this is a bit more committed because I do make a bit more units uh, with this. But uh, yeah, yeah, it just, uh, it's just just a pressure that is <laughs> has a high chance to kill. And, uh, <laughs> I think this game I was supposed to kill him as well, pretty easily. But uh, the micro was very sub sub average. And I also lost like three roaches to the banshees or something before anything happened. Okay, yeah, let's let's take a look at that actually. So, because it feels like your build is kind of designed to kill a guy who's playing Banshees, right? Because they're not yeah. as effective. The Master Pair did help him a lot, but so he sees you coming across, and we'll just kind of fast forward. You do some good micro to pull back the weak roaches. So he doesn't get any roaches yet, but then at the front of your base, the Banshees managing to get a Ravager low, another one. So far, you've saved them all, but that's of yeah, course I not going to last. I lose both of these though, both of the Ravagers, don't I? Maybe not. Oh, we do end up I losing two. Do. Yes. So, if they go, what's what's the nightmare here? Is it if they just have like a, they've gone like quicker extra barracks, or they have a siege tank or something like that? I think if there's a siege tank, then their medibacks are really late, and I have a pretty good scouting, so I can play it a bit differently if I see they're playing that defensive. Uh, but uh, yeah, just in general, I think like. Any sort of build that has like good marine count early is yeah. probably the hardest because then if they get get the siege tank and get like decently fast medivac, then it's a little bit awkward for me when the counter attack comes, especially if I lost any units because I might have to because I kind of want to drone freely after for a while. So it's it's just kind of like a, I feel like you should always play. Well, I don't want to say too much, but. I don't know why you, you wouldn't you play like three CC two one <laughs> against the two base openings. To be honest, <clears throat> well, that's that's exactly what I was thinking. Is three CC against a two base opening? Like if we go back to raw fundamentals, which I think sometimes pros sometimes they do, sometimes they forget to. You're doing a two base opening, and he's rushing an insanely fast third base, right? So it is definitely greedy playing three base against a two base zerg and. It really feels like it works for Terran because the Banshee that you don't have any mobile anti-air as a Zerg. That's why you can normally get away with it. But against the two base player, it seems like it's incredibly risky. And obviously this gave you a massive, massive lead in this game. So just to highlight the, the build, by the way, for anyone who wants to know, this is a 15-15 opening to go over the basics. You drone up pretty hard. You've taken that standard kind of about a minute 25. I think it's like an 18 gas, right? Um, in the opening. Um... Well, I just make it, I make it 16 on minerals and then I make it with the 17 drone. <clears throat> and we're just going to rally guys onto forward. there without going under minerals. You even make sure you always put a drone on the natural before rallying onto the gas. And that's specifically because you want to make sure you make four queens straight away, right? Yeah, well, you don't even need as much gas as I'm mining here, but I can still afford to use all my larva, larva and uh, make, all, make all the four queens, so... It's, it's not too precise. Well, you don't have to be too precise, but uh, just uh, just kind of want to have enough money to never tack larva. And that's the huge thing with the 15 15, because those two queens pop out so early. So normally these injects don't pop till after three minutes. Instead, about 255, you're already pumping out seven more drones. And getting that natural full of workers really quickly is why you have a big economy boost early on with this build compared to a normal build. And obviously you've given up link speed, you've given up a third base, but you immediately then you go for an extra gas, a second and third gas and a roach warren. And then you go for overlord speed next up and you stop at 41 drones and you basically just go for, you know, no roach speed, just roaches, about 12 of them. You morph as many into ravages and you get three queens and an overlord. In the past, you used to do this with roach speed. Sometimes you'd only walk two queens across the map 
uh, you know, last year when you were playing it. Um, obviously, this one really seems to just prioritize speed, getting across the map, and making sure you have the Dropper Lord for mobility. Obviously, the Dropper Lord allows you to spread creep outside their base. Is this something you just feel is probably the overall better option? Because like you said, if they have enough defense, you just pick off the depots with Bile and spread creep outside their base, and you basically don't commit your roaches at all, right? Well, it's hard to say. I think that's just different. I do like their roach speed variation as well. Uh, just because, like I said, uh, I feel like the counter marine drop and that kind of stuff is pretty rough, especially if you don't have the roach speed and you have no lean speed, so it might be hard to catch them up, especially if you have, like, I guess I don't have that many queens aether. Yeah. Uh, but uh, obviously with this, I can also get the roach speed pretty, pretty quick afterwards, technically. But uh, I think it's just different. But this one does have more hitting power initially for sure because that one just comes a bit later and i feel like a pretty late tank is gonna be out as well by the time the road speed variation hits is it fair to say if they've gone two barracks on the low ground you're probably more committed and you're trying to basically really look for the the win a lot more if they've gone for the low ground two racks reaper opening i don't have to i think uh I think that gives you an option to not commit so much as well, just because, uh, well, you don't, you, you don't really have to. I don't think that's like a reason why you would have to commit harder, but and is that, is that you have like you a can... lot, you can do, you can get a lot of damage done when there's the Rexes, and if they just make three bunkers, they're probably still going to be fine with the tank usually in that case. So like just killing the Rexes or forcing them to lift, get delayed the combat shield and that kind of stuff, maybe even delay the steam. Uh, well, you wouldn't usually delay Steam, but you could delay the Combat Shell. It's usually good enough. But uh... Well, it's even better value then, right? So actually, yeah, I guess I guess it's it's like you you have even less pressure on you to do damage in that case yeah, because, because you're getting rid like... of most of their production by forcing those barracks to lift. Yeah, they have nothing really to attack you with after that. That's awesome. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because, you know, it's it's kind of funny that for... 13 years in StarCraft, like, low ground barracks was just considered, like, the weirdest, greediest thing ever that, like, Gumiho would occasionally do and no one else. And then, obviously, people have, you know, a lot of Terrans have started doing it. And you, uh, Rainer, kind of a few of the players uh, occasionally solo with a Baneling bus to actually punish it once in a while. But um, it, it, it seems like it's surprisingly solid. And I guess it caught me off guard because I, I thought, oh, this is going to be a good build to mix in, you know, one in every four or five games, but people can't be doing it every game and then there's guys like beyond and cure who just do it every single time maru was doing it every game for a while i i don't know i feel like you have been exceptionally good at shutting it down and i don't know if it's been the best opening for them in terms of success over the last year would you would you agree or would you say no it's fine i think it's pretty good but uh, at the same time it it's i don't think it's the best opening ever I do feel like if the Zerg, well, like, I guess the thing is that if the Zerg, if I feel like if Zerg sees the follow up uh, with like Obi Scout or something pretty early on, Zerg has a good chance to get in a good spot and get a bit ahead. Yeah. But uh, it's just that you don't really know always because they can make two Marines pretty fast and just deny scouting and then you might be in black and uh, that makes it harder. But uh, I don't think it's like the best opening, but it's okay. That didn't seem to be that. Uh, initially, I thought it was pretty bad as well, actually. And uh, to be honest, I, I don't think I have a team. I very rarely lose to it. But, yeah. But uh, I do feel like I get in pretty bad spots sometimes nowadays. I do like that. I feel like sometimes, you know, you're a bit too good at the game for your own good, Cyril, and we have to kind of press you a little bit for brass tacks and make you admit, well, I never lose to it. And then we kind of go, oh, so maybe it's not that good. <laughs> Just being a bit cheeky there. But I think I think it's, yeah, I, I totally agree. Because it does seem to get in very good positions consistently. I think you're just good at, at surviving and not getting overwhelmed. Um, if we do want to talk about the rest of this game, obviously you're miles ahead and you kind of just, just roll over it from here. Just to break down from the Terran side, because um, chat made a really good point. They actually said, well, Maru didn't go 3cc. You know, he built the command center in the wall after four minutes. The thing is, I think effectively he's gone four Hellions, which are kind of useless first Queens and Roaches and a Reaper, and two Banshees. And even though he does get his second and third Barracks down then soon after, um, actually if he just went straight third Command Center into 2-1-1, I think he would have been in a much better position to defend this. 
And uh, you, you kind of hinted at that earlier, saying, well, you know, 2 one one's pretty good after 3cc. But I, I think any build that relies too much on Hellions and Banshees is always going to get in trouble against a Zerg that's not even making Ling Speed, which is what Hellions are there to deal with, and is just going to shove you with Roaches to deal with SCVs and Hellions on the ground, and Queens to deal with Banshees. So there's a, a very nice thing where, obviously, if you wait about two minutes, your army's pretty trash. But there's a window here where he's relying on a couple Marines, two Banshees, a couple Hellions. That's exactly what this push punishes. Like you said, you were hoping to get a bit of damage, spread some creep. You ended up, I think it's fair to say, almost winning the game with this push and setting yourself up for a pretty easy macro game. Yeah, I actually didn't remember he only made four Hellions, which is, uh, I think four Hellions is reasonable, but uh, just the two Banshees are so unnecessary. Like, I think he should have just made one. Max one and no cloak, uh, cloak there because uh, I mean I'm gonna have an overs here for sure or then it's like an option that I might do like two base muta even which I probably wouldn't do but <laughs> it's still an option so that would also be very bad bad build or a match for a banshee so this two is kind of bad. Yeah. Did you think you could have maybe spread some corrosive biles across the banshees a little bit more here rather than just on the bunker just to try to stop the mass repair there? Sorry, what did you say? Do you think you could have uh, tried to actually get the Banshees sniped there by basically dropping oh. one or two Corrosive Biles underneath the repair? So every time the SCVs are repairing, you just, every five seconds, put one Corrosive Bile underneath to try to kill the SCVs? Oh, you mean, oh, you mean because it, but he isn't repairing, you mean under the Banshees? Yeah. Well, well I, guess... I mean, he's not really repairing them though, but uh, I think oh, he would micro, but... It would be good for sure. It's just that, in a way, the bunkers are the main priority, just because I do have only five ravagers, which isn't even enough to one shot the bunker. So I do feel like if I don't get the bunkers instantly and it just gets infinite value out of them, uh, it's pretty bad for me. Because the banshees are not really a problem, because there's three queens there with a bunch of transfuses. If I just uh, micro and uh, Dean lose the overseer, uh, banshees yeah. would have been completely useless. Do you think it's worth just putting the Overseer in the Oversight Pervert mode, just uh, above your Queens? Yeah, it is. I mean, it's just not moving it forward, I guess, but uh, putting it in a Observer mode a little bit behind would be a good move, yeah. Alright, awesome, man. Well, last question for this game. What I've always loved about this opening is that you get such an early scout, because your lair finishes at about four minutes, you immediately go in with an Overseer, so, if we don't see him going for Banshees here, is there a change-up to the build order? Do you think you would have to maybe build a few less Roaches or something like that? Or do you think you'd probably still just commit exactly the same no matter what? Um, well, I could do... Uh, you could uh, you can do whatever there. Uh, I didn't even see there was a tech lab there, by the way. <laughs> so, it's not the best scouting there, but... Uh, uh, yeah, you. I mean, you can do a lot of stuff here. Yeah, luckily you saw the uh, you Banshee can, you, fly you past can the less. Oh, I guess. Well, you, you, I could, I mean, I mean, it just depends. I feel like if there's no tank, you can usually commit decent, reasonably hard. But if I have still like a really fast tank there, <clears throat> then I would just not make as many roaches, I guess. But uh, I feel yeah. like you can, like you, you, with the build order, you can play around a lot. And uh, that doesn't really make a big difference if you make four roaches more or less. I actually, I, I, I really like the build because like you said, you can always just creep contain and kill the depots. I mean, I want to I wanna very quickly just remind everyone watching of, um, I probably should have already had this open, but, <clears throat> um, you know, you kind of made uh, Maru very paranoid back when you guys were, were playing a bit with this build and you started doing a lot of fake pushes last year where there were games where you would move across with like three roaches and two queens and then you'd just like, go home basically and he'd be like building three bunkers and siege tanks and freaking the heck out and you'd be like oh i don't even need to commit to this so i i kind of like the flexibility inherent with this and the fact that your overseer kind of sees everything that goes on i think this might be an example of where it really looked to maru like you were gonna two base push him and you actually built quite a few roaches if we look at this old um video here let me just fix up my display so sick pig is off the screen um and Maru delayed well, his third command was center a massively. This was a very different game, if I recall correctly, but uh, it, it does have a similar idea to some extent, sure. <laughs> yeah, 
It was was this yeah completely different one for sure. Let's take a look. I think that was. Uh, yes, I opened. This was like a gasless opening, wasn't it? Let me take a look. If I recall correctly. Oh yeah, this was this was a different one. Because you guys played two series in every Masters Coliseum, which makes it really fun looking up VODs because they are... Uh... Yeah, yeah, this series actually... Ah, here we go, Neo Humanity. So Neo Humanity Game 2 was where you just killed him with a Roach Bush, I believe. Where he'd gone for two barracks on the natural. And you literally just got him with a, a Roach Speed 44 drone, Mass Roach Ravager push. So I think this was the best of three you guys played in the group stage of Masters Coliseum 6. And then in the... Um... Nice micro. <laughs> um, well, uh, I'm not sure if that's that nice, but uh, <laughs> I guess it was good enough in that case. Me and everyone in the chat feels more connected to you than we ever have before, Serral. You know, you, apparently, if you're fighting elsewhere on the map and winning the game with a push, you might make one small suboptimal micro move in the entire game and, and contaminates on the factory as well, which is beautiful. So, this was actually really, really nice um, because you, you scared the crap out of him. So it was in the following series to this where, ah, here we go. <clears throat> Here's the series. So we see like different variations of this push. So this is the 44 drone version where I know you've got more drones now as we zoom in, but that's because you've already started droning where you only built seven roaches, walked two queens across, your overlord dropped creep outside his base. And this was like, a, yeah, I think it was, oh, sorry. It was, it was like nine, nine or 10 roaches in total. And this was like a, a real, uh, I would say, it hits like about 20 seconds later than what you did in this tournament, but it kind of forces this big reaction with the bunkers and the tanks. And I think it's, it's kind of cool that even with this version, which you could argue is a little bit more committed with the roach speed, even though you had three more drones, you're able to transition out of it really smoothly. And we see that if Maru just survives, it's not really enough because you're spreading creep outside of his base. So we can kind of see the examples of, it feels like you're putting Maru in a little bit of a very frustrating corner with this build where he really needs to, to, as efficiently as possible, stop this push without falling too far behind. Yeah, I was for sure playing around uh, with ideas a lot, a lot in this, this time and that time and age uh, in my CBTs. And uh, the 15 has was some a lot of fun. And uh, actually, the builds were also pretty good for sure, but uh, they're not the not the greatest at the same time they they do have their weaknesses that's for sure that's what i like to see though you know you've been doing things which aren't a hundred percent rock solid i mean we look at the fundamentals of starcraft shoving roaches and queens at your opponent at five to six minutes every game isn't the most well-rounded game plan i'm sure there are counters to it as, as good as you've made it look there's a reason why you're not doing it every game i can imagine yeah i mean initially it was mainly against the two-rex reaper right yeah, I don't think uh, you have to necessarily do it otherwise, and uh, just even like normal, a lot of normal roach openings are get you in better positions a lot of the time. But uh, yeah, I guess it's always hard to play for the opponent when there's some new stuff and uh, you haven't seen it as much. It's hard to always have the right, right ideas and responses to the Zerg strategies in that case. Yeah, I, I, I think that series was just particularly interesting as well because the the final mind game in that series was my favorite. So just to show this kind of evolution of the 15-15 for the viewers and remind yourself as well, I'm sure you you don't forget this Neo Humanity game when you're up to no, zero this in this series. Was amazing. This I is like the every game it is on pra in practice. I never lost it. This build is beautiful. I've done guides on this this build. I've done it on ladder and it massively increased my win rate. And I literally am the most lazy, worst Zerg vs. Terran player of all time. And I'm beating people so much better than me with it. This is the I'm pretending to roach push you and rushing ultras like disgustingly early. So let's let's skim through and, and talk about it um, a little bit. Any 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 cliff notes on the build? Like, is it just basically it, it's 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 basically the fastest ultra build of all time, right? Well, not exactly. I remember Starbuck doing a two-base ultra build in CVP back in, uh, uh, I don't know, 2012 maybe, but uh, it's it's a pretty fast. Well, I guess in the wings of Flipper, the, the other builds were pretty late. So if you watch the timer, then it's uh, it's on the faster side for sure. I mean, 
I, I don't think Maru was expecting gigantic space cows to stampede him at like the eight minute mark, I think is when you get your first couple ultras with the kindness plating. So um, it's, it's awesome to see an infestation pit go down at about four minutes 30. You've got an early carapace upgrade. And um, Maru's, you know, a little bit afraid of those roach bushes that you've been causing him trouble with. Your hive starts at the five minute mark. Um, you then go ling speed. You start taking more gases on your third, which are still just droning up your third now. Take your fourth on the rich gas base out front, the trap base here on Neo Humanity, right? Everyone, everyone always takes that base and then loses it. It's just there to bait the Terran into pushing you. Um, <laughs> and and yeah, yeah, you're just going to rush ultras. Um, I was wondering, you're going to go Vi Viper here. Do you ever think it's worth going in Festa or is it just you need Viper to deal with the tanks? Yeah, so I was thinking about Infest. Well, actually, this build was uh, this build was my gamer's eight uh, killer build because I Neo Humanity is obviously a pretty bad Zerg map, so this was my gamer's eight special. But I never, I didn't play that many CVTs there. But uh, yeah, to talk about the build, uh, I was thinking about doing uh, Infestors, but uh, like you said, uh, tanks are a bit of a problem, and uh, if they have like a seven seven tanks or something like that, then they actually start killing the ultras pretty fast. So I just thought that catching the units not that important. Just disable like two, two or well, like three or four tanks is more what I need because uh, yeah, the marines won't do anything because I will always hit with plus two carapace against uh, plus one infantry weapons. So mm. like the tanks are the only thing that I had to be worried of. That makes perfect sense, actually. Um, yeah, this was a really cool one. I mean, it was just such a, a different build. This was not something you expect from pro Zerg players, um, unless their name is like Bly or something. So it was really cool to see you. We don't really think of you and Bly as being the same style of player, but <laughs> Russian Ultras out. Uh, this was a really, really slick build. And, and Maru had a pretty, you know, pretty clean three base eight racks timing here with Marauders mixed in. And uh, it was 8 minutes 40. You came in with 1-2 uh, upgrades. Well, you did go in just before plus 2 carapace, but we'll pretend that finished. Um, blinding yeah. clouds on the tanks, ultra flank from three sides. Like, this was a beautiful, beautiful game. Yeah, I, like, I think this was, like, the closest game I had with this. And uh, him going, like, Marauder 8 tracks. Well, I guess he scouted the ultras, and that's why he went Marauders. Uh, was, was, like, something that I think should have probably killed me. One one of the things that should have killed me, but uh, yeah, the build was more more to kill like fast four base kind of stuff. Not really this kind of marauder all ins, but uh, it worked here as well. To be honest, I'm not sure if I should have won this game, but uh, yeah, probably. I mean, it, it at this felt point, like, damn probably close. like it's it's pretty even at this. Well, I'm actually winning probably at this point, right? Yeah, well, I, I am it... right. He has no up two two even coming. Yeah, yeah, it was a it was a big all in from him. But like, if he if he paid a bit more patiently with the early Marauder transition, it's not like Ultras just automatically win the game or anything like that. Yeah. But um, there is like a lot more efficiency with this build than normal Zerg vs Terran because you're not making banelings, and that's what I think um makes it it quite nice. And like, there's there's a lot of fights where if it goes well for you, it can go super crazy well very quickly if you land good spells and. You get like an ultra flank. I think if you attack from one side into his first push, you lose this game for sure. But because you came in with like the very nice three side of the attack plus the, the blinding cloud, I think it worked out really nicely. So anyways, I just wanted to show this series to think about like kind of context, that roach push. And that's why I think starting with that was such a good way to start the series. But now we're going to move into the big, the big stuff, which is of course the Rad Huset game. So any, any final thoughts on kind of that history between you or that last game we were watching while we watched the early game of Rad Huset? Well, pretty confident, uh, just uh, always uh, do pretty good against Maru uh, if I get in fine spots going to the mid game. <clears throat> so I didn't really have any major plans in this series. I kind of want to see see how it goes and uh, if I have to adjust my play. Well, how much I have to adjust my play, but uh, I didn't really have to do much of adjustmenting there. By the way, so your teammate Rain is in the chat and he's been saying don't answer the question, stop telling people how to how to stop Zerg attacks. Um any any words for Rainer there or just get good maybe? I don't know. Yeah, I'd be a little bit worried. <laughs> I don't want to say too much there. <laughs> <laughs> he's there, he says your lawyer says don't answer those questions. Don't tell Pig anything. 
Don't let the fans know. It's like we, can, we can keep it a little bit vague. We don't need to give away all the secrets today. But we yeah, do appreciate you coming on and, much away. and talking about it. Um, is there... But we can talk about... Uh, I feel like most of the stuff is pretty straightforward. It's just not give Terrans too many ideas. Straightforward ways to counter counter my stuff or Turk stuff in center. And we are all good. But yeah, oh. this game, uh, I went through the obvious speed. Uh, the only reason why I did that was because uh, I initially thought, well, Kalasur was in my group and he was playing a lot of rat who said in his, uh, well, his past games, past like two months before I am Katowice. So I wanted to do obvious speed build against him on this map. But he ended up vetoing the map against me. So I didn't get to use it against him. So I, I just decided that I'll throw it in against Maru here. What can go wrong? So, you, I mean, you feel favored on this map, so it's good to make sure you don't get surprised by anything silly, right? Yeah. Well, I guess, like, the main silly thing that I was worried of was, like, double CC Banshee. Uh, double Starboard Banshee. Uh, not, not Banshee, Battle like Cruiser, I mean. That's, yeah, like, that... the main, main worry I had. Yeah. And if that's pretty... There's a lot of main base to scout on this map, so you're going to have the double Overlord scout coming in now to see what's going on. Um, it's an interesting map, by the way, because, I mean, you say we don't want to give Terran too many ideas. I think there's one pretty big idea from everyone who watched this series, which is don't get hit by 27 burrowed fungals in one game. Because, I mean, that's the story of this game was some of the best infest usage we've seen. And the fact that Maru still almost beat you shows me that if he could have dodged a few more of those fungals, or maybe even done the Twitch chat advice and built a raven, this would be a very... You know, could have been a very different game. And that was surprising to me because I thought Terran can't possibly defend their expansions on this map. I, I, I thought there's no way in the late game Terran can get enough mining. But uh, he did a pretty good job. I mean, I know you don't have a crazy amount of experience on it. It's only really coming out because it's in the finals. There's no, you know, very few vetoes in the best of seven. Were you surprised by how well he hung on in this map? I'm never surprised. But uh, I think... Uh... I I just played a little bit. I could have played it better for sure. Uh, I didn't. I mean, I, it was just the thing that I didn't take his expansions fast enough, right? Just a very simple mistake of do, not doing that was the biggest issue. But uh, I think if I would take faster, his base is a bit faster, then it's very it, hard for him to take. Kind well, of mining, very, mining very out the two, the two middle bases would be really yeah. key, right? Like you probably can't get the top left corner. But you can at least maybe threaten to take it, which you do end up doing later in this game. But those middle bases are, are really key because he did end up getting some mining off it. I think the southern one. Yeah, he got a decent amount there actually, and I think you can also mine a little bit out of the cold usually, but uh, that obviously takes some some time because you have to have like a wiper there in case they have a tank and that kind of stuff. But you can always get like a couple hundreds of minerals there per patch, uh, and that's also very helpful. All right, so nice links around here attempt on the Cyclones. I noticed with your Queen Micro, you basically were just pulling back the weak ones and trying to focus fire the Cyclones. Is that it? Well, I think I was just attack moving there. I didn't really do target fire, but uh, usually... Well, if there would be more Reapers, then I think you would want to target fire, but if there's no Reapers, it doesn't really matter that much what you are hitting, but uh, yeah, just move back and... Uh, that's all you can do, really. To be and honest, obviously, this cyclone, yeah. <laughs> well, this uh, cyclone has very little anti-micro because even if you move back, then it starts shooting a new queen instantly. Anyways, it's not like it, not like it has any cooldown. Yeah, it's not the old fourteen range, but cooldown of a few seconds on the lock-on cyclone. Uh, obviously, you tried to get rid of the Hellions first as well because they're a bit more mobile and they counter the Lings a little bit more. Got rid of them and then you cleaned it up. You've gone double upgrades before Lair and Baneling Nest because this is just the best way to set up for a big macro game. Um, did you... I can't remember. Did you play Muters at all on this map? I don't think you did, right? No, I didn't. Well, I usually do, but not this series, no. Oh, well, not this game, I mean. Uh, but uh, I guess the main thinking was that because I did scout the really fast Dapuli Pay, <coughs> uh, I just wanted to match the upgrades a little bit. So I went for a fast Dapuli Evo myself. And uh, I don't really like going mutas after 
after a faster double Ibe, uh, fast double Ivo usually. So right, that You'd was kind of my thinking the there. But the I think Mutas was the right call here, and you should usually play Mutas on this map for sure. But uh, cool. I guess I was just confident playing the Hydra style. Okay, uh, that's really interesting. Now you do manage to deflect them on this left side. That's a very common drop angle, so good reaction there. I think by default, if we watch just before that, your army is sitting in a really safe central location. I think a lot of people leave their army out on the front or just off in some random corner, but being in the middle, you can respond really quickly. So I think that's a, a good little detail. The other detail here is that creep tumor. Do we give credit to someone else or did you figure out that you could mine out one mineral patch and then your creep tumor could jump across there? Well, I saw Dark do it, but uh, you can also do it without, that, without mining the mineral on the left side. Oh, it still reaches even without mining the minerals. Not on that side, but on the other side. Ah, okay, I see. Cool, good to know but Dark yeah, is dark. Uh, he's yeah. making your strats for you, man. He is, truly. So Baneling Drop's always something good to kind of mix in there. And you do just kind of do this to pressure. You ended up kind of dodging turrets to do this. So your goal at this point is just massing Ling Bane. Is 83 workers the final worker count? You're going towards Hive, like, what What are your main goals right now? Is it just defend, spread, creep? Yeah, just defend, spread, creep. I, I think I should have made more drones there, but uh, to be honest, I didn't really like how this game was going too much. Uh, I actually thought my position was worse than it It was here, just because my macro was kind of poor. Uh, this game, a lot of supply blocks and that kind of stuff. And uh, here I'm getting pulled apart a little bit as well, so I didn't really have the room to drone up more, which I would have liked to do. Especially on this map, but uh, mainly just defend him, getting the hive tech out, getting those wipers out, getting the adrenaline leading glands out, those important upgrades. How high would you go on drones, maximum? On this map or in general? On this map, yeah. I think you can go like 95 on this map. Cool. I think that makes sense, right? Because it's very hard to do as many counter attacks and stuff, so you just want to have a bit more money to swarm over. Yeah, you can't really do much on this map, but you're always have, you kind of have to play for the long game, right? Uh, like Terran has, Terran, Terran's just gonna take his bases and uh, there isn't... You can like maybe attack the fifth base or something, but... It's not the greatest angle. So I'm gonna pause at this moment for a second, just to look at your setup and really focus in on this. I love that you're building dual spellcasters, because you're really preparing for a very long game. Now you're in Festers. I think they just... Do they get just added to your army hotkey? No way. I would so never you just do, have no control that. group for your infestors. They just go to the rally point. Yeah. I'm already planning to use the burrow with them only, so they're just randomly everywhere. Awesome. You're basically like, hey, I grab these guys from my rally point. Let's click your hatcheries, which is here. So this here is the staging point. We grab infestors from there periodically. We borrow them, spread them around the map, and use them that way. We've also got main army here, which you can see most of the new Ling Bane is being rallied into on number one. Vipers on number two. Hatcheries on number three. We've got another Ling Bane army in the main on number four. And another Zergling army on number seven, which appears to be the same as number four. Partially? Can you explain what's going on there? I think it's just poor play. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what, what's it, the seven hotkey? So number seven is 35 are, are Zerglings. Really? Is, this, is it the same links at my, my fourth hotkey? Yeah, I think so. Because if I click it, it just selects all these guys up here. These 35 links are patrolling in the main. Well, number four also has some four? Bane links. So number four, wait, so number seven doesn't include these Zerglings behind your pocket base, whereas number four does. Number four also has the Ling Bane that's behind your natural. Ah, so number four is the units in your main your natural and your pocket base all combined. And number seven is just the ones in your main base that you're going to be actively microing a little bit more. Well, I think that's just a mistake. I probably forgot to separate them and I wouldn't be surprised if I'm going to separate them in like the next five seconds. Now, a lot of players out there would say, why are you wasting time loading eight Zerglings into a drop and then queuing it on a very specific path to dodge missile turrets and dropping it? This seems like there's no way it's going to do big damage. Is there a reasoning? Does it just feel good to put pressure back on your opponent? Yeah, for the most part. I mean, link drops don't really do much anyways, uh, but it's mainly just uh, 
uh, kill a couple of They always can trade somewhat positively, usually. And uh, it's just something if you have the APM to do it, you should always do it, I guess. But at the same time, you're not really looking for major damage ever with those. The bail in drops are, well, they're still low risk, but they have more potential for sure. But I guess in this game, because there were so many turrets, I didn't really think I had a opportunity to get to the mineral line ever. So I would have to drop them a little bit more far away. So links would do the job better that, in that game. In that case, sense. Is it fair to say that um, if you just force your opponent to respond in some way, it's already done kind of as much or more than you expect it to? Yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, just because the attention it takes to deal with stuff. Well, I mean, like dealing with a couple of links doesn't actually take much, uh, but it still takes something. It so. still pulls their screen away, right? In a game where otherwise yeah. you're sitting purely on the defensive. So. I think Solar is a guy who I watch a lot of, and I, he's almost always on the defense for like the first 13 minutes of every Zerg versus Terran game. And he looks like he's about to die the whole time, and then he gets Hive Tech and kind of, you know, counterattacks and gets in a really good position. But I've always felt like um, there is like a APM game, attention game, right? So if you can, this costs zero resources, right? Eight Zerglings is four supply. It's like a hundred minerals. It costs you almost nothing. So you don't really care about losing those Zerglings or that Overlord. And the fact that you're kind of running around forcing him to micro to a second base, it seems like a good way just to pull his attention away. And I see like the moment you do that, you actually start exploding forwards across the map, moving your infestors forward. So I, I think it's actually a cool little detail, which does maybe not doesn't change everything. But I, I like that idea that on this giant map where you've got drops pinning you, defending three, four different bases with your Ling Bane split up, that you found the APM to do that. It, it seems like a good idea. Yeah, it's just low risk and uh, even especially if you get burrow, burrow uh, it becomes very, very strong because if you split them everywhere, you might for like three scans even with like eight links. So that's very useful. But uh, yeah, I think it's just something that if you have the extra APM to you, you do it, uh, why not? But. Uh, Sometimes also doing that might cost you in some other department. Maybe you get hit by a widow mine because you did that. So it's suddenly not worth it anymore. But uh, it just depends a little bit. I'm trying to squeeze those extra bonus actions like that where it doesn't give you a big tangible gain. But if there's even like a moment of breathing room, that's a good time to squeeze it in, right? But if you're doing it, as you said, there's three drops hitting you at that exact moment, it's almost always going to lead to you messing up too much in other places. So, I, you know, there's there's like a subtle art where... I don't think I can even ask you to describe, oh, how do you choose to do that? Because it's kind of instinctive. There's a feel for your managing fights in four different places. You can kind of sense when there's just, you've done your macro, you've defended your bases, you're in good position. You just kind of know you can spare the APM for a second to load that up and go drop it, right? Yeah. Awesome. So at this point, there's lots of fighting going on. And I love that your infestors went really deep in his territory and are trying to come in from behind. Yeah, that's the way you want to do it. They are always scanning under them, but not behind them usually. And that's why this map's a big problem for Maru, I think. Because your first yeah. fungal basically landed there. That was the first big one you've landed this game. And he keeps scanning a bit too far forward, not realizing, hey, there's so much space on this map. Your turrets are a bit further back and he keeps just barely missing those scans. And there's a little bit of bad luck, you could say there. You know, there's always a little bit of luck in StarCraft. There is quite a few where he barely misses it. But um, very nice play for you to always sneak them as far forward without venturing into turret territory. Now, this is where the golden question comes from, Cyril. Should Maru have listened to Twitch chat and the YouTube comment section and just built a raven? That is a good question, but uh, I don't have an answer, answer for that just yet. <laughs> I can't wait to see it in the next the next tournament. People are going to start building ravens, and you're just going to abduct them and kill them at the start of every fight. You're going to like your whole game plan is going to be abducting ravens. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would. More, well, I mean, I can imagine their ravens dying. Uh, they would probably die a bunch, but at the same time, it's not like they're that expensive. It'd be always a terrible loss. But uh, I guess in general, just uh, their own players. Well, it depends a little bit. I feel like if you. If you, like, use control groups all the time, then it doesn't really make it any harder to control your army with Ravens. But if you use any F2, then it obviously makes it very, very hard. And uh, with the way their production works, they usually 
do use F2 because they can't hotkey their units that are in production. Uh, so it's just something that. Well, we're now getting in. The reason why they don't make them. Yeah, it, it it is tricky to get used to. It's like a new habit that needs to be formed. But um, I love the way you're moving around here. And what's crazy is, you know, as a guy who does regularly use four control groups for their army, sometimes those infestors are full manual because they are assassins. They are little ambush snipers. Their whole job is to, like, hide in enemy territory and just hide out there as long as possible. So these guys are all manually controlled. And we're going to talk about how the hell you get these infestors on the front line and how ridiculous it is as well as how you use them to distract, find damage, and get lovely fights like this. But I want to go back just a second, because we're already in this infester stage of the game, and I want to ignore the fights, and I just want to focus on these infestors. Um, do you use a camera location for your rally point? No. I don't. So you just click on the minimap to go to your rally point and grab those infestors from there? Yeah. I do it that way, usually. Uh... I think on this map, my rally point's in a bit of an awkward spot, but uh, I feel like on usually most maps, the rally point would be in a better spot. Oh, this is kind of cool. In this game, you actually, like this round, you built three infestors and they just got thrown into your main army key. And then you quickly borrowed them, sent them forwards to the gold base, and then you stole them out of your control group, number one. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a mistake probably, but uh, it's also possible. Yeah. It's, let's let's well, watch what happens. That. Yeah. It's always possible that it just happened to be, I didn't, well, I mean like links are links and investors and yeah, I didn't really separate them early enough. Technically having them in the same hotkey at the start isn't even that bad, I guess, because then they will come to the front and then you can kind of separate them after they arrive at the front. But uh, I don't think I did that intentionally. Well, it's interesting because you actually did such a good job keeping your infestors alive. You didn't really need to build new infestors past this point. So I'm going to have to go back earlier in the replay to double check how we produce those and kind of the, the macro cycle, I guess, of getting those guys onto the front line constantly so early in the game. Because I really feel that was what was so interesting. Not only did you have good infestor positioning, there was a few times when Maru killed two or three infestors and I think he was expecting you to be a normal Zerg and then not have infestors for a few minutes. And there was always another two infestors, then another three infestors, then another two infestors. And he's like, can you not? Can you just piss off and, you know, I, I should have killed the two infestors and you should be like a normal Zerg where you wait for those infestors to die. Then you spend another minute hanging out on Ling Bane and then you go, oh, I don't have any infestors. And then you start building infestors and you very slowly get them to the front, by which point Terrence had a big chance to take map control to get his production up his turrets his planetaries and all that good stuff so i really feel that's uh that's really cool so with these first infestors we see we sent them over there and then we did try to move them south to catch this drop these infestors and then you burrow them and you move them off the first ones into their forward positions which was really well done the next ones yeah. next infestor production, i did do I think a really good job i did do a really good job of make, remaking investors this game I, i've quite commonly like you said it's it feels like sometimes you just don't have any investors and then you have to make them. But in this game, I feel like I made them kind of like in every time I made links, I always made investors as well, at least later on. It kind of felt that way because I always had had them. I probably had like eight at some point as well. So, Yeah, I think that this period, like he starts kind of scanning and killing investors. And the moment you, you were only doing it with two investors, but the moment that one died, instantly you build an investor and... You can kind of see you've built it. You've put it on control four as well, which is... Or actually, no, sorry. That was your forward investor there. Was on control four, which is cool. And that's just basically you in the heat of the moment saying, hey, this investor is kind of important. Let's put him on number four. You don't always have your investors on number four because this was your one full energy boy that was kind of behind his army. You actually gave it a control group, which I thought was really cool. Yeah, well, I just had a free control group, right? So why not use it, I guess? Um, there's no real reason to have a second army. You well, would... If he was dropping you, four would be your Ling Bane yeah. defending, right? Yeah. I love that. A lot of guys, a lot of the older players, I think, are a little bit more like, this control group's for drop defense, this control group's for infestors. I feel like um, you and, and all the players who are younger than you, Clem Rainer, these guys as well, I think you guys are very good at just fluidly being like, this is my secondary hotkey, you know? If I'm attacking, it can be another forward spellcaster or attacking hotkey or something like that. If I'm defending, it can be a drop defense key. I like that you're very good at, on the fly, changing the priority of what you're using your control groups for. So that's actually really nice, something us old dogs could use a bit more of. 
Yeah, I think having just flexible hotkeys is pretty good. Obviously, most of the hotkeys uh, do have like their main purpose, that if it's like a standard game for the most part. Uh, like the main army is always in the same hotkey, and for the most part, units are in the same hotkeys, but I think having some flexibility there is always, always good. Like the Prude Lord hotkey is pretty much my only hotkey that I have only for Prude Lords. I don't use it or anything else, which is kind of dumb, but uh, besides that, um, I'm pretty fre flexible there. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I feel like that, that Prude Lord hotkey is special in the late game, and I especially think uh, with everything you did in 2018 with those, like, uh, 26 range broodlords that you uh you had a lot of success with i think you're you know rightfully they need their own control group for that stutter step focus fire micro that uh that, that used to be so powerful with them doesn't make as much of a difference with them these days but it's still pretty good now yeah the ruler hotkey was actually one of the later things i added I'm, i don't remember when i added it oh really i might might have not have it into an 18 you might have just control clicked and just kind of manually stutter step i don't back remember in the day. how i did it but uh ah. I didn't always have a pruler hotkey. That was something I added when late games became more, more, uh, they started happening more. So I'm going to pause at this moment because you've been doing this good job. You, you keep, you, you have three more infestors because you just lost your infestors. So you've had these other three infestors sitting at your rally point for a while and you've kind of moved them forward. You've got one in the south, one in the middle, one in the north. And that's just, once again, you're building three more infestors because you're anticipating these guys are going to die soon. So I love that as he got better at catching the infestors, you weren't waiting for them to die. Like you did the first two infestors, you waited for like one of them to die, you started building another one. And now you're like, I have three infestors, I lost my, my previous one up front. You kind of, it's, it's almost like you've got layered infestor production. You had two up front, you built three more. As the first two die, you build another three to replace the first two even though you've already got new infestors behind it. And then these next three will replace these three. So you've just got this constant stream of infestors on the front. Now that, cool. Wow, pig. Wow, Serral, you're so impressive. You cheesed out Maru in game one. You're so bad. I love Terrans. I think Zerg's easy. You just aim with Banelings and do some OP fungal. I think what I want from this is to answer those people who are blinded by their hatred of the bugs a little bit. And I want to explain what else you're doing at this stage of the game. Because it's not just running an army around, remaxing, throwing fungals. You have to spread creep, number one. You have to keep grabbing those infestors, borrowing them, spreading them across the map. After each engagement, whether you get EMP'd or cast spells, your vipers need to go back and consume hit points. You've been using your natural hatchery for that a lot, as well as your main hive. You can see they're both damaged. So you'll often be like, say after a fight, you might grab your vipers. Would you just go shift click, consume building, come back to the front? Or do you tell them to consume two buildings before they come back to the front? Eight. I usually nowadays uh, do it on more buildings, but it depends a little bit how much in a rush you are. Uh, if you're in a like, if you do it mid fight, then I usually put them on one building. But if the fight has, is already over, then I would would do it on two buildings usually. Uh, maybe the gases or something like that. Less important, just because uh, I have had my fair share of killing my own hatcheries at this point. So something I'm trying to get uh, rid of. Yeah, so like in this one, you've told them to go suck energy off the hive, but you didn't give them another shift click back. Because like you said, you were in the middle of a battle. You pulled back for half a second, but he chased you. So you immediately were like, hey, I don't have time to queue up these vipers to do extra things. Just go gather some energy once, keep microing on the front. You need to keep spreading creep in the midst of this. And one thing you pointed out earlier that you didn't do as well as you would have liked this game was take the forward hatcheries and mine them out. Probably could have done that maybe a minute ago, maybe two minutes ago, you could already have the top middle and the bottom middle base fully saturated, right? Yeah, I could have done that way earlier. Also, creep spread is not the best this game for sure. Lacking a lot of obvious spread. There's a lot of stuff I could have done better this game, but uh, I think like the main thing was just uh, not taking the bases faster because that's kind of, that is kind of the main win condition, right? Yeah, so just to hit that home, every five minerals you mine from that base, is five minerals of damage. It's actually the most efficient way to do damage in a late game because you mine 800 minerals a minute, that gives you plus 800 minerals off a base. They lose 800 minerals of, of future mining. If you mine this for five minutes, five times eight, bam. Like that is a massive amount. 4,000 minerals down for them, 4,000 minerals up for you. And we almost always see the late game base trades come down to a much smaller margin than, than 8,000 minerals, right? For, because 4,000 each way, that's a massive, massive difference. 
mining the gases out also quite important. So that's something that's that's really huge, and that is the biggest priority. But I like this sense of like, hey, Mari's liberator counterattacking you. You're keeping the investors. You're really focused on the engagements. You're not doing things perfectly, right? You you are kind of giving up creep spread as a focus to stay in his face and keep landing these ambushes and keep rebuilding your investors, borrowing them forward, sneaking them in behind enemy lines. You've even got them behind the planetary in the north. So even if he scans in front, you can kind of bring that around behind and, and catch him. So there's actually a lot of different things going on at this stage. Now, at this point in the game, we haven't talked too much about the engagements, but we'll, we'll definitely do that a little bit. That top left base, you've been hammering over and over. You don't really need to take that out 100%, but it is a good way to like keep him down and small, right? Do you think going Corruptors here, I mean, I think it's necessary, but do you think maybe you should have done it slightly earlier in preparation of the Liberator swap? Because I feel like a lot of Zergs lose momentum when those Liberators come out and they're still stuck on Hydralisks. I don't think I had to do them faster this game specifically just because I did have a decent hydro count uh, for a very, lo very long time. Uh, I think I should have probably made like one or two just for the range leap harass earlier. But uh, yeah, usually you can get away with three late corruptors. Uh, so it's nice to get some upgrades on them as well before you actually start start making them. So you start doing the Nidus Lurker house. I like that you did this with a pretty small squad, just five Lurkers. Like you didn't overcommit like a crazy amount to Lurkers. Because if you do go like 10, 15 Lurkers and you can't get a Nidus in the back, it feels a bit like wasted supply, right? Was that something you were cautious of? Yeah, well, the thing is that the Lurkers don't really have that much potential at this point anymore anyways. So just having a couple usually do the same thing as then it would. Especially on this map again. Uh, I think it comes a lot down to the map as well. Um, some other maps I would potentially make more. Uh, but uh, it's just that the less you have, the more you have on the front. So why go too hard when you don't think they have that much potential? Maru, are you <laughs> religious? Do you believe in God? Me or Maru? You. <laughs> well, that's a good question. <laughs> I would have to go in. My answer would be too deep, wouldn't it? <laughs> you can have that in an Anatra stream. Someone's got your back, mate. Someone's got your back. This was um, three scans for Maru. Was it? No, four. One, two, three, four. <laughs> and two scans are just barely missing that infester by a pixel. That was um, yeah, obviously... That's pretty rough. <laughs> that was pretty pretty ridiculous man that was perfect placement so can you break down why you put the infester on this pixel and, and how you predicted his scan placement it just looked like the correct pixel to me <laughs> <laughs> not much else to it <laughs> he man. messed an ultra scan there <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh oh uh... You know, StarCraft is filled with, like, little lucky moments and back and forth. And sometimes, you know, Widowmine kills 20 of your own units. Sometimes it kills 20 Banelings. And, and sometimes the Banelings, you know, connect or the Fungal connects or you just get scanned. That was just a, a comical moment. I mean, five scans, not getting the Infesta is, is absolutely hilarious. <laughs> but, um... Yeah. It's, it, it, I don't think that in itself was, was game-winning or anything like that. I, I do think it was kind of the final cherry on top of the cake right when he's getting a bit more control. It definitely gave you some momentum. Um, at this stage, were you feeling super confident? Mm, well, I don't remember anymore, but uh, I, I would imagine I would be very confident. I think a lot of this game, I wasn't too confident, but uh, I did get a lot of game, game winning fungals. And I think usually with, if I would be getting constantly fungals like this, I would win easier, but uh, just because I didn't mine enough of his stuff while doing all this, you know, it wasn't that good, but uh, especially after that last fungal on the coast, I, <laughs> I would imagine I was pretty confident that I was going to take this one. It's kind of funny because a lot of players, um, you know, say Terran is always mowing the lawn, trying to clear the creep in Zerg vs Terran, but you're actually mowing the lawn, constantly trying to clear those turrets and sensor towers out front, right? To open up new rooms so your infestors could get deeper. So every time you took a fight like that, I feel we can't stress how game-changing that was in the momentum, those couple of fungals. Because not only did you get really good fights with them, which are otherwise very hard to get, um, 
the Terrans all turtled up, but you also cleared all those turrets and sensor towers out front, which clears the way to potentially catch him with the next round of fungals. So I think there's like a, a flow on effect always in StarCraft where momentum builds over time. And I think we can really look at this game as right from the first fungals, you did a great job of capitalizing on them. A lot of people would get the first fungals, but it was not only the constant infestors, it was them marching forward, but it was also every time you took a fight, look at the way you're clearing these turrets and stuff. I, I really think this was, and it seems like that was your main priority, right? Just clear all of his static defense, but don't dive into the production. You're not trying to kill him. You're just trying to remove his map control. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think it's again a little bit of a rat with a special that this kind of game happens where he's gonna have mass two rats in the middle, but uh, it, what 100% I was just trying to kill the two rats and give my investors more room uh, because I, I mean, I just believe that the only way to win fights here realistically is, is to land the fungal, right? Because, well, either you get a surround or you get the fungal, right? Because otherwise they just run back, let the mine sit, and it's always hard. So that's kind of always what you want to want to in a way to one you want to do that just because uh, in case that's like the only way to win the fights i feel like usually yeah and you your technique when you see widow mines is you just hold position your army and then you just kind of box the front zerglings and just move them down forwards to take those widow mines right yeah it depends but that's usually usually my go to it's if uh, it's a really best, big battle do you think usually do you think like if it's a huge battle, you might just you, you won't use the whole position. You'll just kind of grab no, the front units no, and click no, them through their army. No, never in fights. It's uh, terrible in fights, but uh, in those when you're just clearing mines, it's in those cases it's usually the best. Uh, the problem with with the fault position thing is also if they start retargeting the mine, then it gets a bit annoying sometimes. <laughs> but uh, usually, usually. Those mines in the middle of the map are not really paid attention to so that's, much that... Would you say that's the Clem experience? The difference between Clem and Maru is Clem's just going to keep retargeting that Widow Mine for 20 seconds straight? <laughs> yeah, you could say that. Because he's, uh, he's very yeah. tryhard with them. <laughs> I don't think there's a better word to describe Clem, right? He's the ultimate tryhard micro-terran. He is just going to click on his units for days. Um... Is that is that the main difference between Maru and Clem? Clem's just a, a little bit more kind of frantic and non-stop with his micro. Um. Well, I do think. Uh, yeah, micro. But I do feel like Clem as well is just uh, a bit faster on the aggression. Uh, well, I guess the split, split pushing in the mid game. Uh, I don't think. Sometimes with Clem it's pretty hard to keep up with, but with Maru it's usually. Usually doable, well, more doable, I guess. Uh, I think Clem's just a bit faster, and yeah. a bit better on the micro, but Maru has his own strength then. And, I mean, Rain is in chat right now, and this brings to point um, injuries. Uh, a lot of the, the fanboys will say the only reason you can beat Maru is because he's with shoulder injury, you know? It's just it's just that. Um, have you ever had injuries, sore wrists, sore pains? I know Rainer overtrained a bit recently and really needs to sort that out to make sure he doesn't have that develop into anything worse. Um, have you ever had any issues or are you mostly healthy? I'm mostly healthy. Never had any major issues. I mean, I had pains here and there, but uh, I think they were just normal stuff so no no i never had anything i had to take care of but uh, i guess uh, do, do maybe, your hands hover maybe over i just the take keyboards? good care of myself uh, preemptively <laughs> lots of sauna i'm sure helps do you i know the koreans normally kind of hover over the keyboard a bit like a piano player do you do that or do you plant your wrists on the the table in front of the keyboard and mouse Wait, what do they do their hands kind of hover over the keyboard so they don't actually touch the desk at all with their hands. Not every Korean player, but a lot of them. Oh. Yeah. No, no, I don't I don't do that. Okay. That's that's an interesting one, because I don't know what's better, but I've noticed most uh, foreigners, we, we all kind of just plant our wrist on the desk and then use the keyboard. But a lot of the, key, the, the, the Koreans... I, I've heard a theory. Someone said it's because they thought, well, piano's very similar and that's really figured out so we should do it like piano players and, and most of the brood war players i think all got taught to play like that even if they didn't start that way so i could be wrong maybe people can fact check me on that but that's interesting that you don't have any <laughs> i issues. never heard of that but it could be could be something 
Have you, um, I mean, obviously there's some, some, some funny habits different players have and that sort of thing, but otherwise health-wise, sauna, very good for your wrists. What, what, uh, are you doing any other exercise activity, just playing golf? Um, well, I, I was doing some running, uh, especially at the end of last year and uh, some gymming, but uh, it uh, depends a little bit. I don't do massively ultra stuff, but... Sometimes when I'm motivated. Just a bit of, little bit of cardio, a bit of exercise, clears the head, that sort of thing. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. You've got a dog as well, so I imagine you take the dog for walks and that sort of thing. Yeah, dog walking is a daily habit of mine. But yeah, that's actually... I don't really a... count that as an exercise, but I guess it is one. Well, that's the difference between you and the standard American player, you know, and, and Australians as well. We're just like, oh, gorging our face with Cheetos. If we don't have a pet dog, we just sit there playing games all day. We walk our pet dog in World of Warcraft instead. But it's that healthy European lifestyle, man. You don't even count it as exercise. Makes a big difference. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we can talk more about the game here. So at this point, it, it feels kind of rough because he's starting to get these middle bases. You're trying to take that top left to lure him out of position. Is there an argument here that you should have maybe gone a bit more like a Sue style Zerg and basically just thrown Ling Bane at him and just traded and basically won with your giant bank advantage? Um, well, I don't think I had an opportunity here. It's just uh, I didn't really find an angle. I mean, this is kind of what I'm trying, right? But I feel like there's just no angle anymore just because he has two reds everywhere. So my investors don't land. I don't really get the Sue rounds. I can't really get Sue rounds anywhere. Uh, and there's mines everywhere, so I don't think that really works, but uh, I'm still gonna try that for a while. Uh, but I think that was kind of my mistake as well, I probably should have went for the Prulers a bit faster here. But at the same time, if I go Prulers now, it, it's not that easy because his lip count's pretty high, so my investors can't get fungals on the coast, and it's all messy. I guess this is a really good fight actually here. This is fantastic for you, isn't it? And I, I think what's fascinating is you. this fight was set up with that hatchery in the top left corner. That hatchery seems like such a dumb move. You end up cancelling this top left hatch like seven or eight times this game and even losing it once without a cancel, I think. And I'm sure a lot of yeah. players are like, oh, that's a dumb move. That's so bad. It's not doing anything. But this is where, you know, you got to look at the big picture. You made his whole army move to the top left to defend it. And then you quickly rotated your mo more mobile army and smashed his gold base. And you killed, you know, all, all those turrets, planetary, lots of SCVs. I think taking that hatchery in the top left was absolutely crucial. I think if you didn't take that, he could just wedge his army between these two bases in the bottom and just kind of chill. And, and you'd actually be in massive trouble. So I actually think that might be potentially, we could even call it a game winning move if you want to be a bit hyperbolic. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, in this situation, you always want to put pressure on the Terran somewhere, uh, to force them to split their stuff, and that's the only way to get opportunities, realistically, to get those good fights, potentially, and, uh, or just get money on his side, I guess. Oh, good scan on your Infestor. You can see your Infestors aren't landing those money fungals anymore, and it's, it's kind of hard for you to fight. So you here are basically saying, I don't have enough Banelings and I have no Infestors. I can't fight that, right? But if you landed a Fungal, would you have taken a big fight there? Absolutely. Always. You always take a fight if you land a Fungal. Even if you only have a few Banelings in the mix? The Ultras are good enough? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. I mean, like, sure, if there's, like, no Banelings, even, like, even if, like, Ling or Ultra and you get, like, all the coasts, I would probably take it. Well, maybe not if I don't get, like, a Chain Fungal. But if you have like yeah. any bailings, like you don't need that many bailings usually, like even like just 10 bailings and it's not bad. Yeah, I think you only had like three or four, which is why I asked in that scenario. But I, I think you're right. Just a few bailings is good. And it's kind of interesting because his army is getting massive. He has like an insane ghost count at this point, like 13 ghosts. He had like 16 before. Lots of marauders and marines. So even if you land a single fungal on like say seven or eight ghosts, that looks good. But if you then attack without a good enough rest of your army to proper overwhelm him, it's going to go pretty badly for you. And a lot of Zergs fall into that trap. Like you had one fungal in the north of this map much earlier, maybe around 12 minutes, 13 minutes, where you got a really good fungal. So you turned around and fought him. But all you had was like 10 Hydras with one three and like two Banelings and a few Zerglings. And you just ended up losing that whole little miniature army because you couldn't actually get through the Medivac healing despite getting a really sick fungal. So I think always yeah. having the Banelings behind your front line, it's actually so important to actually crash over 
kill the marines and ghosts, but also stop them from sniping so that your ultras can finish everything off, right? Yeah, I mean, I guess the thing with fighting as coast is just, just that you're always so committed that you kind of have to somewhat win the fight always, or at least have an army that can force the coast to move back. And then if you get the fungal, if you... Even if you get the fun first fungal down, uh, then the f moment the fungal burst off, uh, they just start sniping again and everything dies if you don't have enough units to get on top of the coast instantly. I just picked up on you doing a sicko move here, man. This is actually, I was going to ask you about this. What do most Zergs do, even GMs and pros? They go back to gather energy with their Corruptor Vibot key number two. And then two seconds later, Terran pushes, drops, sends a Liberator in, and they select number two, and they click it with their army to go defend, and the Viper consumes, like, two energy off the Extractor, and then it just comes back to the front, you're like, oh, crap, I have a full energy, a, a low energy Viper. You tell it to do that again. Right afterwards, you tell the Corruptors and the Vipers to move, and your Viper's basically just running back and forwards between buildings in your army, not consuming. Now, you actually not only tell it to consume both Extractors, you also deselect it from your control group here. We click number two now, you've removed it from the control group. Now, this is insane because you now need to remember there's a Viper floating above this hatchery that you have to come back to collect. I know this is not an easy question and I don't think there's an easy answer, but how do you remember that there's a Viper there? <laughs> well, I hope I did remember this game, but uh, I don't really know why I would do that in that case anyways, but I guess it's possible that I'm planning to separate separate the Viper at this point, maybe. Oh, but, I didn't separate it. Because no, sometimes you, you, you kind just of added to have it like... back in. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. I sometimes, I sometimes I feel like when the game gets a bit later, it's nice to have Vipers on a separate hotkey as the Corruptors and play on two sides because uh, you can have like the Ling Ultra Baneling Viper on one side and then you can kind of like use the Corruptors to snipe like Strangle Lips on the middle of the map or something. So ah. that could have happened there, but I guess it didn't. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure why I separated it. Separate it there. Didn't really do anything. Well, it's, it's, it's just interesting. I just want to catch the moment where you added it back to your army key, because here you move, you select your corruptors, you move them up, you move your army up, you select your hatcheries, and because you're so fast, you F2 here, and I think you, you F2'd, clicked the Viper in your little box, I believe, in the wireframe, and then you've added it back into number two and you're waiting for it to gather a little bit more energy, but you're already thinking, yeah, I'm going to move this to the north in a moment. So you're consciously saying, okay, Viper, you got a bit of energy time to rejoin the force. That's actually really cool. Attention to detail in, in a late game. I guess you could argue there's not as much stuff to manage because both of you have mined out most of your bases now, right? It starts to become really about efficiency at this stage of the game. Are you kind of swapping your mindset into that efficiency focus? Well, I don't know if I was at this point exactly. I'm probably still hopeful that I can play this kind of more aggressive army and just mine the top top left side. But uh, obviously my plan was to do a Prudler switch at some point, eventually, at least with my last monies. So I guess we're kind of reaching that point. So probably was getting a bit more on the cost efficient side now, but uh, I am still making a lot of links. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's kind of funny that that last Infestor Fungal, just to look at that fight one more time, you were just a bit too close to the army, right? So you should have yeah. waited for your Lings to get in range so they were shooting the Zerglings, or you should have moved a bit further to the left. Which one would you prefer here? Just, I, I mean, you could also let your army clump up a little bit more because your Banelings are a little bit further behind. What, what would you do different? Move Infestor to the left? Um, yeah, just move the Infestor to the left. It's usually... usually... Well, well, it doesn't really make a difference, right? But uh, I feel like I feel like you kind of would do both usually, <laughs> just to yeah. play it safe, because it doesn't really take much. And it's just one click there, and but uh, yeah, the investor should be or always a little bit more far away for sure. Uh, because that's just the kind of dumb way to lose it. So at this point, he's got that bottom base he's mining out, the gold base as well, and this top left. You've got a few minerals left that you're mining, but not many. Now you have saved some minerals in your third base. Had you noticed that? Or is this something you don't notice till much later? I was saving, well, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I always intentionally save minerals on my initial bases, but uh, 
obviously sometimes it it's just it's just that sometimes uh well it's pretty rare that you actually have that many minerals on your back bases so maybe in this game i didn't quite realize it yet because otherwise i would be already mining them i would think but um, it, it's something I do quite often to save some minerals on the basis that I can never lose anyways. So you're going for Broodlords as kind of like the one final efficiency army to, to try to win this game. Are you thinking yeah. of this as like make Broodlords, kill a base and it's kind of an all in? Or are you just looking to like deny a base with the Broodlords and then steal the mining? Uh, do you feel like, I guess a lot of Zergs feel desperate in this scenario because they feel like Terran's so much more efficient at this stage of the game. And they're, they're dropping mules on those last bases. And, and it feels like he's going to mine more than you. And now your bank's almost gone. I mean, it, it, do you feel desperate at all? Or is it still just the same game of just look for efficient fights? Well, it's a little bit desperate times there, in a way. Uh, but obviously his army is also kind of crap. But uh, I guess the main, main point at this point is just to play for the left, left top left base. Which I'm a little bit late to already, because if he moves that base like consistently, I feel like it's gonna mine out before my Prullers actually, actually get to the top left side. But uh, yeah, I was kind of thinking of just playing playing for the last base with the Prullers. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I don't think he moved it enough. I, I don't know how many orbitals he does actually have. Maybe he lost a lot of them or something. Nine. That many? Yeah. How many moves are there at the top left location? Not I guess right he's actually now. starving on gas as well a little bit. Yeah, he actually starts starving on gas, which hurts him a lot. Now, what I like about Broodlords is they can die to snipe. Um, you have five overseers, but more importantly, you use fungal. Now, there's a technique here. Um, I'll just explain it, um, and I think you can add any details. Basically, you keep your infestor pack just behind the front, and then you manually pull a single infestor forward through a fungal. You rotate it to the back of the pack. You pull another infestor forward so that you're always, if he comes in snipe range, you've always got at least one infestor ready to fungal. And you want to make sure you throw that fungal as quickly as possible to interrupt any snipes. But you don't want all six infestors on the front line because then one EMP or two EMPs can ruin your day. Is there any other, anything else you look for with the infestor broodlord micro? Well, uh, it's mainly just not getting EMP it, right? Because the moment you get EMP it is really bad. But uh, you can use some shift click techniques there, uh, like fungal, force all them to fungal and then instantly shift click back and it usually works pretty nicely. But uh, for the most part it would be be best to always just manually control a couple of them to the front. But, uh, when you say hard, shift click, do you actually back. shift cast the fungal or do you just shift click home, like shift, shift click it back? just after you basically cast the fungal. I, I haven't thought about it, but there's, <laughs> there's one way that works very nicely. I don't I'm, know. It's I'm going to go out on a works. limb and say you don't shift click the fungal very often because you're going to, you might do it, but from like very close to the throwing position. The important thing with spellcasters, just for the noobs in chat, you know, trying to bring down the Serral analysis, just to a bit of a newbie level every now and then, you want your spellcaster to be basically in range when you tell the spell to cast. Because if it's a little bit too far back, by the time it moves up to that position to throw the spell, it's not really landing in an optimal position anymore. But definitely shift-clicking them back is a really good one. And you yeah, did do a lot of well, the rotating. thing is that when you're playing against Coast, though, there's kind of this one location where you know that's like your only, only risk. So you might mm. just fungal that location as a safety measure. Because it's like, that's like uh, the only place where the Coast can be realistically if they're coming to snipe your stuff. It's like pre-firing in, in, in Counter-Strike or something where you're just, you're basically like, I'm just going to pre-fire at this angle. If someone pops out, I'm aiming right where their head is going to pop out. That's essentially what you're doing with the infestors. Pretty much. So at this point, you, I, I want to go back to that big fight because I honestly feel like <laughs> this is like the, the thing which is so hard to pick. Like how, when do you commit with the Ling Bane in that big battle that we like, that's such a big battle so stressful so hard to calculate like how to choose when to fight and when not to fight and i like how patient you were because i would i would have definitely pulled the trigger on sending my ling bane forward a bit earlier i would have panicked and done that but you really waited for him to fully commit and it feels like the trick is you don't want 
to get baited into attacking too far in front of your broodlords, right? Because then your infestors aren't really able to fungal because they're running forward in a clump, copying EMPs. He's kind of spread out in a concave, shooting down on you. The Vikings are shooting down. Your broodlords are maybe a little behind your Lingbane. So watching this fight, just one more time, any details on, on kind of what your focus is as we rewatch this from your camera viewpoint? It's just mainly, mainly trying to trying to fight with the prolord infestor combination but the moment you kind of have to send it because it's the coast are gonna land their snipes uh it's when you have to start using the bailings and uh, i mean these were pretty badly managed fights by me to be honest uh, i think i was uh, rushed into this position because like i said i didn't want to get him give him mind to mind this base uh, i would usually want to take this a bit more bit slower but uh, yeah, usually it's just try to play with the fungals as long as you can. And the moment you can't really play with the fungals, you have to go in. Or then if you get like the other coast with the fungal, then you can also just try to bail and bust that, I guess, in a way. Because then you have a chance to kill other coast with their bailings. So if we were to buy a bit more time, because you do let him spread out in a big firing arc here, is it just your, arm, your broodlords should have pulled to the right a little bit sooner and just kind of siege the base from a distance? Because... He kind of baits you into a fight here with a beautiful pre-spread from him. Is yeah. pulling the Broodlords the most important thing? Oh, you mean pulling them back? Yeah. Yeah, well, I think you always want to be guiding the Broodlords. For the most part. That's always what you... Would you clump you them up a little bit do. as well, so they're all on top of each other? No, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> That's a bit much. But, uh, yeah, it depends, right? If you play against, like, Tor comps, then sometimes... Stacking them up can be good, but uh, at the same time, usually, no, just guiding them is good enough. And they kind of do stack up anyways when you, if you guide them consistently during the fight. Beautiful. I, I think that's, um, that's pretty cool then. I mean, this fight, even though it was not optimal for you, uh, as clean as it could have been, your, your infestors weren't able to do much in that battle. Yeah. You just kind of had the numbers to overwhelm, right? You, you did get a few broodlords sniped, but a lot of them survived and... Denying this base is kind of checkmate. Do you think you knew those bottom bases were just completely gone at this point? Yeah, I kind of figured it out. Uh, they were already mining pretty for pretty long. And uh, it, I, I kind of... Well, even if, it, even if they wouldn't be mined out, it's still this is like the only location that realistically would matter at this point anyways. And uh, yeah, I do think that last fight, well, the fight we just had was, it was very rushed there. I think I could have... Because his army was absolute garbage, right? It was pretty bad, actually. Uh, I think if I do get with a little bit more caution and a uh, little bit more carefully, I would have easily saved like 50 supply of units there. Pretty big amount of supply, but a win is a win, and no game is ever perfect, especially when you're playing against Maru. I really do truly feel that this was such an impressive game for Maru. On a map where a lot of us felt like, you know, as much as it's hard to finish the Terran off, it is hard to defend all these distant bases. And with the number of good fungal ambushes you landed in the, the kind of 10 to 17 minute range, the fact that he dragged you down to your final resources, only a 40 army supply advantage. I mean, it's still obviously it's, it's a significant advantage. You've got the game in the bag at this point. But I still think this was really um, impressive for me watching. So I was really happy that we got to see such a, a close match. And um, as you said, I mean, you're not surprised. You're just like, hey, I expect Maru to play really good. He is kind of the, the king of the late game ZVT, right? Yeah. Do you think yeah, I mean, on different I mean, maps? I was... yeah. Say it, go ahead. I was just going to say, do you think on like different maps, maybe Maru is even favored versus you or something? Or do you think this map kind of just becomes even just like any other ZVT map in the end game? Mm. Well, it's all about... Uh... I mean, I think if I mine on this map, usually this would be an absolutely amazing map. If I just mi start mining the bases a bit earlier. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, it depends always what's late game. I think if I would have to play like a pro lord late game against anyone, I wouldn't exactly be that confident. But uh, usually I always try to win the game in the kind of like the mid with the mid game comps, anyways. It's kind of the way you want to play Zerg, anyways. So. I'd be probably a bit less confident if if I had to start making prulers on a verse map. Well, I guess like prulers, anyway, 
Yeah, I already went that good on this map, Aether, but... Yeah, it's you just can't... that, uh, as if you, if you have to make Brule Lord, it's always a little bit of a bad position. Well, not exactly, but in a way. Well, at this point, Maru... That's like the just... last resort in my eyes. That's like the last resort. Yeah, it's it's not an ideal situation. So, I do personally think Twitch chat felt really good that a Raven got built 38 minutes into this game. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I'm sure they were like, why didn't you build this earlier, you idiot? You could have just made the Raven and won the game. But he should win the game now that he's built it. He's got a few Vikings as well. And uh, for you, it's obviously just trying to you know, bully him off this base. He keeps trying to steal 25 minerals at a time by dropping the mules there. But as long as you keep your army here, you're mining more minerals. You've also put your workers back on these reserve minerals that you were saving in your natural and third base. So you yeah. still had a few thousand more minerals. And you were just very spellcaster focused because you felt like, oh, he's got to build vikings and ghosts. And as long as I have plenty of fungal, some parasitic bombs, blinding clouds, you kind of just felt like you'd be able to deal with him. And it's probably just the most efficient way to spend your gas bank, right? Yeah, exactly. I do think uh, I was making a bit too many investors here just because I do want to... Well, the thing is that from my... If you think about it, like the only thing he could ever true his uh, is for a draw or something. So I would want to have like a bit more cruel lords and a bit more corruptor so that never happens. But uh, in the moment, I thought... Like if he was, was to push the location, I think uh, investors, just more investors would be nice. But uh, if you think about it in a way that his only way to ever do anything in that game is to play for a draw, then I think the investors were pretty poor choice, like max 10 I should have made. Uh, especially since the map had so little minerals left that every investor I made basically meant that <laughs> I could almost make one less pro lords because of it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, at the end of the day, you did end up closing it out. And this was just such an exciting map to see so much late game between you two. We've been hoping for this match for a long time. And, um, you know, we're not going to go over the rest of the series because obviously I've already stolen a lot of your time. And I don't think it was as exciting as just the way you, you kind of crushed game one. And then this game, I feel like, was the spiritual game of that grand finals. Um, a great way to win $150,000 for you. And uh, it looked really awesome. So uh, I guess... Um, that's just awesome. Thank you everyone for watching. I uh, I hope I mixed in enough of your questions that I saw on Twitter and that sort of stuff as well, people asking. But uh, any final thoughts here as we uh, as we close out? Uh, not anything in major, really. Uh, I don't think the last game was... Uh, well, it was he should have probably won that one, but... Uh, yeah, besides that, I don't think the game three was all too... I don't even remember what was the game three, actually. Wasn't very um, interesting, probably. Oh, I was a terrible all in I did. <laughs> now I remember. Oh, oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was it hard? It wasn't a terrible all in. It was like a good pillar choice, but the games just didn't go too well. <clears throat> I lost yeah. like four obvious or something to the Viking. If I recall correctly. But yeah, I wasn't the most interesting series besides. Well, most games weren't that interesting. I do think the last game was a little bit interesting. But. Uh, was beating Dark make... the true test? Yeah, he was the hardest one for sure. Uh, I could have lost a lot of those games. The nice equilibrium build also. Was, uh, I had some practice with it, but uh, I didn't play it to the perfection, that's for sure. That's so funny. My, I, I, When I saw that match, I was like, I thought you were drunk or something. I was like, what is he doing? This does not look like a good build. And then I quickly went to, oh my god, this is an amazing build. Any other Zerg would screw yeah, this know, up and die to the Bane Bust. It was beautiful. <laughs> Who thinks to wall off the gold base with Roach War and Evo Chamber? I, I loved it. It was just such a cool creative way. And I mean, Dark's like a raging bull. And I really feel like you matadored him. You know, you were waving the red flag in front of him like, I'm taking the gold base, come and get it. And you know Dark can't resist that. The man always wants to just shoveling Bane into your base. So it was, I, I thought you really baited him really nicely. Yeah, it was, a, it was a good build, and uh, I mean, I kind of felt like I was going to win it, uh, even if the, I didn't play the build exactly perfectly, just because it, it's, again, one of the things that it's like, he doesn't exactly know how to play against it, but if I <laughs> would do it again, it probably wouldn't be as good anymore.
Well, it's still impressive because it's a build which is such a one-off, right? You're not going to put thousands of games of practice into that build. So I thought it was pretty well executed under pressure. I think overall this was a great tournament. I'd love to see things line up for you. No no sneaky ZVZ losses. As you said, you've been, you've been you know, on point for a while now. But you did have a, a few tournaments that you didn't win in the last year. You know, you didn't win everything. Um, but uh, I think this is the start of a, a nice run for you. So awesome, man. Thanks so much for sharing your insights, your secrets. Apologies to Rainer, who, who now needs to find a different Zerg to, to learn builds off because you've just spoiled all the secrets of Zerg vs. Terran. But that's okay. I'm sure he'll be <laughs> fine. <Did> I? <laughs> yeah, man. He's, he's, he's like, nope, can't, can't learn from Yona anymore. You just you ruined everything. He's going to have to go study under someone else, man. No. Yeah. I feel a little bad, but at the same time, luckily I didn't give it all too much away. No, I, I don't the, think you did. I am, maybe I am the, maybe the Maybe the Raven was the only thing that Terrence can take <laughs> away from this. I mean, I've already been shouting this like for like, I mean, this game was so clearly a game where a raven was needed. <laughs> like, after five scans, miss the infester, you're kind of like, a, maybe we should build a raven. But, anyways, um, just a, a final shout out to Rainer. He did say he solved his wrist issue, by the way. He said he's uh, swapped to Protoss. So, um, apparently, all of his issues just went away magically. The man continues to be a mima. Um, good to see you guys and, and Trigger just being such a fantastic team. Love what you guys are doing at Basilisk. So keep it up, Cyril. Thanks so much for joining us. And thank you so much, Basilisk, for supporting you and uh, StarCraft Esports. Catch you guys next time. Bye.